This is Ibarian X, and this is The Candid Frame. I want you to take a moment and to think about all the different bedrooms that you've had in your lifetime. Go back to when you were a kid or a teenager, or or when you were single or living with someone, and remember what that room looked like. Did you have hardwood floors or, or was it carpet? Were the walls painted a particular color or did you have wood paneling? What were the items sitting on your nightstand? Was it immaculate and tidy or more like an environmental hazard? This space, the bedroom, in all its different manifestations in our lives, is the most intimate, personal space we'll ever occupy. And what we do in this space, how we decorate it, and who we share it with, says so much about who we are and even aspire to be. This is the world that photographer Barbara Peacock has been exploring with her photo project, American Bedroom. In it, she has been photographing people from all over the country, and the resulting painterly images provide an honest glimpse into who we are today which is the result of people opening up both their homes and lives to Barbara. I think there's a lot of very lonely people in the world, and that's something that I've been discovering as I travel. There's a lot of lonely people in the world. And just to talk to a new person, to tell your story to a new person, even if it means bringing them into the bedroom, they agree to it. I, I'm, I'm shocked at how open people are. I'm shocked some, when people say yes. I mean, but then once they say yes, then it's the two of us. And uh, for some reason, people open up to me. I'm fairly friendly. Um, so I don't think they're put off or, or nervous around me. So there's, I think that's helpful. And uh, we, I just talk with them. Maybe we have a little coffee, uh, chit-chat. Or we go right into it, and then we have coffee after, which I want to do with the people if I can, and then I'll listen to their full story. And then sometimes I get their statement right there and then by listening. Her professional photographic career has revolved around her work as a commercial children's photographer, but the call of documentary-style work has always pulled at her. Even her earliest project photographing her own hometown of Westford, Massachusetts, reveals her penchant for people and communities. With a camera in hand, she was able to navigate familiar surroundings in a whole new way. I was hitting the streets and being a fly on the wall. So it, it was the early 80s, and I, had, I was shooting now with a Hasselblad at waist level because I couldn't afford anything else. I don't think anyone paid any attention to me whatsoever. I mean, I was just kind of there with this waist level camera looking at parades and looking at apple blossom festivals and going inside the school and no one stopped me. It was a very different time when I did all that early color work. No one, no, no, no one thought about, oh, this is going to go on the internet or anything like that. So I had free access to the whole town and I don't think anyone thought anything would come of these pictures. It's like, you know, there's Barb taking pictures. Who knew what, you know, anything could come of it. We'll talk to Barbara about the morning that inspired her American Bedroom Project and how her work as a commercial photographer has helped her with her personal projects. Welcome to The Candid Frame. I talk to a lot of people who work on personal projects for the show because my heart is there. Because as much as I like individual photographs that are really beautiful and, and striking and moving, I feel like I always learn so much more from a, a body of work that's on a singular subject. And your project, Hometown, is, is amazing. Not just because of the span of 30 plus years over which you, you, you photographed it, but that it started from turning the lens on something that was very familiar to you. And so many people, when they get a camera, they think that, okay, if I go to some exotic location, 
you know, like the people in National Geographic, I'll be able to make these wonderful photographs because there's nothing around me to photograph. It's all so boring. I know that the project started as part of you know, your studies in, in art school, but tell me about the, the germ of that idea in terms of turning your camera on to the town where you grew up in. What you just said is really interesting because that's exactly what my instructor said when he gave the assignment. We, he wanted us to do a documentary, but not family. So excluding family, I kind of was like, oh, well, what? And then I went home and I saw, you know, I was really influenced by Walker Evans and Dorothea Lang. So I was really when I saw the world, I, I, I was kind of seeing it similar to the way I thought Walker Evans might see it. With these people just standing around outside this grocery store. So the first day I was smoking back then, I stopped in to get a pack of cigarettes and I saw these kids sitting there. And then I went to school again the next day and I came back and they were there again. The next day, the same kids. And it kind of went through my head, the flash of a life and how it moves really fast, but mm -hmm. so slow for for kids and youth, how it's wasted and they're just <laughs> sitting there and, and what they were doing. And it was really interesting to me. So I asked them if I could take the picture and they said yes. And it was a four by five camera at that point. I took it out, set it up. I'm in the middle of the street and I take this photograph of these kids outside of parents' supermarket. And at the time, that was just an iconic store that everybody went to in town. It was kind of buried in one small section of the town. Mm -hmm. And I remember thinking, well, this, it'll always be here. And then down yeah. the line thinking, well, someday, you know, those kids aren't here. And that store has now been plowed down for like, you know, homes that have been built there. So I took that photograph and I brought it and showed my instructor. And he said precisely what you're saying right now. He said, you know, this is, this is the start of something. He said, you don't have to travel to exotic lands to get a great photograph. You can go into your backyard. He said that literally. Mm -hmm. yeah. Tell me about your, your town. For people who have not heard of you before and seen your work, what, what's the town? And, and give us a sort of a brief synopsis of, sure. of what, you know, what makes up the town for you. It's a quintessential small New England town. It's uh, an apple country so a lot of apple orchards in its heyday, and then things changed, of mm -hmm. course. But there was only 8,000 people that lived there when my parents bought a big old Victorian home with a barn and a garage, and we had 10 acres and 60 acres behind that. My dog used to sleep in the street for the whole day. No cars would go by. My mom used to say, the dog's sleeping in the street still. <laughs> and we used to play outside all day until the cowbell rang. Literally, my mom would ring the cowbell, and in we'd wow. come. So we were playing in the trees and building forts and running around and getting dirty. And my dad was from Russia. He was very, uh, you know, he had a very uh, hard work ethic that he taught to us. So we were working hard a lot. But the town was a sleepy little town and that no one had heard of. But the thing about it is, I think if you look at the photographs from that the town, you could almost see those photographs from any small town across the USA, probably to about the Midwest. After that, I don't think you're going to see Minutemen reenacting mm -hmm. like <laughs> and things like that. There's some differences, but it's just a small, small town where everybody knows each other. And there's a couple of diners and there's a couple of gas stations. And it just grew bigger in time. But in the beginning, it was very small. Turning the camera on to a place that you know so well is sort of a double-edged sword typically. There are things about it that only you know, as opposed to someone who just comes outside of the town. But also that familiarity makes it difficult to see. You know, you I know what I mean? A, I had this head full of all the photographers that I was learning about, you know. And I was hitting the streets and being a fly on the wall. So it, it was the early 80s, and I, had, I was shooting now with a Hasselblad. At waist level, because I couldn't afford anything else. Mm -hmm. I don't think anyone paid any attention to me whatsoever. I mean, I was just kind of there with this waist level camera looking at parades and looking at apple blossom festivals and going inside the school and no one stopped me. It was a very different time when I did all that early color work. Yeah. No one thought about, oh, this is going to go on the internet or anything like that. So I had free access to the whole town 
And I don't think anyone thought anything would come of these pictures. It's like, you know, there's Barb taking pictures. Who knew yeah. what, you know, anything could come of it. But I think one of the challenges for a photographer is this idea of being able to see the familiar photographically making that leap. Was it that you were looking at the work of Walker Evans and Dorothea Lang and that you were sort of referencing those to help inspire the photographs that you, you made? I think by now I was completely in love with Bresson and the decisive moment. Mm -hmm. So I was looking for the decisive moment everywhere I looked. So one of one photo that you might be familiar with is the dinner that the gentleman with the cigar yeah. and, and the girl, that, that was taken at a wedding that I was hired to photograph. So I'm photographing this wedding and I'm saying to myself, this is incredible. I have free license to shoot anything I want at all. Because I'm the photographer. Yeah. No one's paying any attention to me. And I got that photograph there at the wedding. I was looking around to try to find, you know, interesting, poignant moments in between what I was supposed to be doing. But that, that complete license to sort of navigate through your town in a way that you probably never had access to as just a young girl growing up in that town. Uh, that must have allowed you to sort of learn and discover things about people, about your communities, about stories, especially over the span of, of, of three decades. Tell me, about, tell me about that aspect of it. Well, it was a very um, open town. Uh, I, I would, for instance, I've known my neighbor for 30 years. So she's known me since I'm a little kid and now, you know, then 10 and then 20 and then 30. And uh, I've seen her garden and I've seen her get her mail and I've walked with her to the store. It's just, uh, it's a quintessential, very small community. And when I met people that were moving in that I didn't know, they actually didn't pay any attention to me at all because mm -hmm. I had no idea what I was doing or who I was. So I really had this bird's eye view and I kind of did this thing where I didn't really look at people. You just kind of get into a situation. You don't really make a lot of eye contact. If you're, let's say I'm at the VFW and mm -hmm. I'm going to photograph a spaghetti supper, you know, I go in and nod uh, and then I disappear. And it's okay that I'm there because no one's kicking me out. <laughs> and, uh, and I'm just kind of moving around taking pictures. So you just wander into different occasions and you start photographing. You didn't go, I like doing this project. I'd like to have access. You just walk in and start making pictures. I didn't even know I was doing a project. There's the other <laughs> thing. True, yeah. I just, I, you know, like I got out of art school and I did the thing that probably a lot of people do. You know, you, you have this uh, idealistic idea that you're going to be an artist. It's mm -hmm. all I wanted to be was an artist. I wanted to be the next Helen Levitt. Literally, that's what I wanted. I just wanted to make art. And, and, and life happens. You've got to make a living. You've got to do this and that. But for a couple of years, I just wandered around. I did the pictures. I worked as a waitress. And that's what my, my life was like. And it was, you know, that's that. And then you've got to make a living. And then you get married and you have kids. And there's other, other things. And then I be became a commercial photographer. So that project... I just kept doing it because I felt in my heart of hearts that that was all, the only tie I had to being an artist mm -hmm. was that project. Like others kept going and they were being successful and they were maybe publishing books or having museum shows. I was still in my little town. I'm having babies. <laughs> I'm, mm -hmm. I'm a commercial photographer now. And, you know, I could get back to my roots if I just grabbed my camera and put on a hat and just went out and kind of disappeared and made some images that kind of filled my soul a little bit. Yeah, I, I was just recently talking to some students at a local art college, and when I would ask, they would show me their portfolios, and more often than not, I was not really interested in their portfolios. I, I said, show me your personal work. Show me, show me the stuff that you, you didn't think to share with us initially, and always that was the stuff that was the meat of the conversations. And, and one of the things I often heard of when we were encouraging them to you know, you should do this. It's like, oh, I don't know. I don't have enough time, blah, blah, blah. And it was just like, oh, you know, this is the stuff you need to do. This stuff that you think is important is teaching you maybe technical skills, but the stuff that's really going to get you somewhere, both personally, creatively, and maybe even professionally, is this stuff on the, on the side. And I love hearing you talk about that in the midst of all the challenges that you had in terms of, like you said, earning a living, raising a family. All the excuses that a lot of people normally have for not pursuing, you know, even a small project, 
you know, not least of which is one that spans over three decades. Right. And I, and I love your reasoning for continuing to pursue it despite all the excuses that could have taken you out of it. Yeah. I mean, there were times I wasn't as efficient with my time as other years, particularly a, a childbirth year, et cetera. Mm-hmm. But what happened for me was with the commercial work, it's really funny that you say that because you have these very fancy portfolios as a commercial photographer. And I was a lifestyle photographer, so I'm photographing children, right? Uh, you have these very fancy portfolios, but guess how you get hired? Mm-hmm. It's the personal work. So you have your website or you have your portfolio, and then you have this other little book, which is a fun book that my, my rep would always say, oh, put your personal work in. And, yeah. they, and they love it, and they hire you because of your personal work. So what you're saying is so true. But um, around 1996, I had now signed with a stock agency, so I was producing these stock images of, you know, milestone moments of childhood, et cetera, and photographing my own kids. So they're very real. Mm -hmm. It's probably the closest thing to reportage. Now, a real reportage photojournalist might not uh, think this is true, but, well, the difference is in a lifestyle shot, Everything is a hired model and the light is set up and, you know, it's a scene. A child's going to eat cereal and, you know, the dog's going to be there. That's your scene. But once you go action, you're photographing a dog and a child that have their own free will. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Everything they do is real. So I've always gone by that, trying to go back to actually the decisive moment in the commercial photography, too, because... And that's why I chose to study with documentary photographers when I finally had enough money. 1996, now I'm making money. I'm in the black. Like, this is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. I have enough money to go to main photographic workshops now and study with Mary Ellen Mark. So it's like monumental. It's incredible. And now that's what got me hooked back into working harder on my project. I realized at that point I had a project. Mm -hmm. Up until then, I was just being an artist and just trying to keep my soul intact, if you will. And so then I progressively continued to study with, um, and then I studied with Eugene and then Ernesto. So those Eugene, years... Eugene uh, Richards and... And, and Ernesto Bazan. Okay. So all those uh, are my mentors, my teachers, and they all taught me a lot. And that got me working a lot harder on the project and, and you know, went from color uh, film mm-hmm. to black and white film for almost 15 years to digital and I, there's even an iPhone shot in the book. Wow. So it went from 4 by 5 to iPhone. <laughs> well, once you realize that you were working on a project, it, it, your assessment of the photographs has to change. Because right? it may have started where you're making sort of individual photographs, but when you're making a, a body of work that, that has a, a point of view, a perspective, how does that change how you not only assess what you've created thus far, but what you create consequently. Yeah, it gets harder. It gets harder because I would go to something, say there was this thing in my town called the gay 90s. And what it was, was anyone who was turning 90 years old Mm -hmm. that year would go and have a a dinner, a lunch, excuse me, a lunch at the VFW. And I went every year to photograph that. And it wasn't an easy thing to photograph. You'd think it would be, it wasn't. Everyone's sitting at round tables and, you know, da, da, da. Yeah. But um, as an exercise, I would always go. And then once you get the image that you think is the image, now if you go next year, you're competing with that image. So it's the same thing with the Apple Blossom Festival. Every year I go to the Apple Blossom Festival. I always shoot before the parade, after the parade, you know, total breasts on in my mm-hmm. head, you never shoot the parade I get it uh, literally and um, you know I got a lot of good images there over the years but yeah you you have to look for other things and then you say what's missing in my repertoire of images what's missing what do I need so some of they cancel each other out and and, and it's sad sometimes because they're good images but they cancel each other out yeah you know you talked about how this documentary style work influenced the work that you did commercially. How about the reverse? Was there anything that you learned from your commercial practice that helped you with the project? That's a, a very interesting question. I don't think anyone's ever asked me that. It's definitely more heavily weighted the other way. Mm-hmm. You do have very long days when you're shooting commercial work. They're 10 to 12 hour days. So your stamina is mm, yeah. imperative. Uh, up, up early and go, go, go. And, you know, 
just staying so focused. So I guess if anything, it would be the focus because you can never lose focus. And when there's, you know, a hundred thousand dollars on a couple of images that are being created and you've got 25 people standing around watching you create these images, but I can work easily like that because I'm almost, it's almost like you're a surgeon at that point. You know, you're just going in to click the shutter and get the emotion of that child or children. Yeah, from from doing similar work, it's it's a real challenge not to be distracted, you know, either by the camera or something else that's going on. And there've been countless times where it's happened to me where I get sort of pulled away, and then a moment plays out, and I'm trying to play catch up in order to get it. It's like you have to be on your A game every second until the moment or the opportunity completely plays out. Absolutely, 100%. Even conversations that you might have, you try. I, I would try to keep them limited you know, to like a minute and then just go and get into my own head. You really do have to stay in your own head for ev- all of this work, mm-hmm. whether it's commercial or personal work. You, know, you really want to stay in your head. You don't want those distractions. You chose a career commercially where you're working with children and doing lifestyle. Why, why did you decide to go in that direction? You know, just sort of segued. I came out of school and like I said, I worked on my project for a while as a waitress and then I really needed to earn some more money. And I ended up working with some commercial photographers as an assistant. Mm -hmm. And I learned uh, a lot. I learned about lighting. I learned about using large cameras, four by fives. And then I continued to study. I always did this like, okay, I know a little bit about four by five. I need to know more. And then I went and took a class. I know a little bit about lighting, but I need to know more. And I went and took a lighting class. So I always sort of educated myself. And then I became, I uh, got my own business going and I became a pretty good uh, commercial photographer. I was doing tabletop stuff, you know, some food and things like that. And then I had kids. And the thing for me and kids is I'm in awe of children. I love children. So it's a love affair. Mm-hmm. I think I've been in love with every child I photographed. And when I had my kids at the same time, I was signing with a stock agency and they, they just said, just photograph your, the, the life of your children. Just do that. And that's what I did. So it was all sort of documentary, but, you know, with nice light and good expressions and and things like that. So I just really got into it and I really, it it made my heart skip a beat. And that's what I tell any, anyone who ever asked me anything about what should I do or, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's all about what makes your heart skip a beat. Did uh, food photography, eh, drop and pops, not so much. Kids, absolutely. I just could photograph them all day long. Yeah, because it's so important to find what that thing is f- for yourself as a, as a photographer because I think that if you find something that you have a really strong affinity and passion for, that you really get to discover how you uniquely photograph it. If you are photographing something that you're really not into, then all you're really doing is applying whatever technical knowledge you have to creating the photographs and that spark of inspiration just eludes you and that's why so much work that you see regardless of genre looks so cookie cutter it looks so similar it's only photographers who really just dive into something that they just like they can't stop talking about even if they're not making photographs that that's that's the imagery that is very unique very exciting to see and to talk about yeah i, I it's fun i still love it to this day i still do some commercial work and you know, I still love it always. So tell me about the process of just editing it. Cause that's, that's, I work on projects that are nowhere close to the duration of time that you dedicated to hometown. But every time I have to sit down and start looking through the work and editing it down, oh, it's a pain in the ass. <laughs> it's, um, it's really, it's, it's brutal. Editing is brutal and you need to have a team of people that you trust. So there's about five people that are my go-to people. And I say this to anybody who's working on a project is, you know, you just have to have those people that you trust their opinion. They're not going to say that they like an image that they don't. They're not going to tell you that something's strong if it's not. So even if it's an image I love, Hmm. if those five people tell me or three of those people tell me that, "Ah, no, it's not, it's not in there then I believe them. It's just very hard. So my son, my older son, has an incredible aesthetic similar to mine. He's he's also studied with Ernesto a lot, and he's actually a painter now, but he has a great eye. And and, and if I have any question at all, he's the deciding factor. Mm, okay. He's great. Ernesto, it, it was he helped curate hometown. 
Oh, okay. So that that was a huge part of, of hometown. You know, he got rid of images that he thought were weak. He got rid of more images than I would have liked, but <laughs> uh, I trust him. And then a handful of other people that I that I believe in their vision. And together, all of us together came up with the images and the sequence. But what's really interesting, just as a side note, when it was time and I had all the images and and and, and pretty much we knew the body of work that the images would be picked from. Mm -hmm. I sat down at my kitchen table in January and the book was printed in April. And I said, you know, I think there's probably an image or two that we're missing. So I went back to these boxes of negatives and pulled them all out and got out a a light table Mm -hmm. (laughs) and looked at them. And I actually found two super great, strong images that I never considered because they had light leaks in them. Oh, yeah. They had these light leaks. And what could you do with an image with a light leak when you're, you know? I I saw one of the ones with the (laughs) the girl. Yeah, that's a wonderful photograph. Well, it was decided that we should leave that light leak in that image as an ode to film. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was no way it could be taken out because it went right through her face and it would, no matter what, it would have looked artificial. Yeah. So we left that in and it took a little convincing on my part, but I ended up agreeing. And then another image, the girl that's smoking the cigarette and no, she's got a cigarette in her hand and she's blowing a bubble Mm -hmm. at a parade with parents there and teachers there. I don't know how that even happened, (laughs) but I was shocked when I saw that picture when I'm looking through these negatives and I started laughing. I'm like, oh my God, this is hysterical. And that that was a new image that I found. It's kind of cool. What did you feel when you finally saw that that final selection of images all laid out in sequence? What what did you feel when you were looking at that body of work and saying, I, I made this? You're in the middle of it, I think, when you're looking at the selection process. And I there were some images I wanted in that were kept out. So I think there was always a little bit of... Um, I don't know, back and forth about the, uh, the end result, but I did put my trust into my, my people. Mm-hmm. And less is more, so there's that. But I think the moment that you might be talking about is at the printer. Oh, yeah. When you go, it's offset print, and you smell the ink, and you're seeing, I mean, it's just unbelievable. And, the, and where I had it printed, the people were so, so wonderful. And I had a, a team of friends that came, People that traveled from California and from North Carolina, and they came up and and helped look at the uh, images because the color aren't so hard, but the black and white yeah. are very difficult. Uh, but it's you do feel uh, you know there's there's this pride that's starting to happen. <laughs> yeah, I, I I've published several. I've published like my sixth book, but I've never been able to be at the printer because they usually print them outside of the U.S. But I dream of a day when I can be there at at the printer. Because my dad was a pressman. And oh, so wow. when I was growing up, I remember being at his shop, seeing him on top of this four-color press, putting <sighs> in the inks. And he would adjust. He, he was amazing. I, ne- I never really appreciated it before because now they have colorimeters and all this computer stuff to, in order to assess the balance of the inks and the colors. But what he would do, he would go to the um, where the the prints were coming out with those teeth mm-hmm. are to keep it from flying out. He would pull out a sheet and then he'd put it up on a table and just by eye, he would see what was happening with the color and go out and make those adjustments. And something I never really appreciated until way later that he was doing it all that by eye. It's incredible. It's incredible. They were like, oh, a quarter point off here and this oh, and that. Yeah. They could see it like instantly. And I want to print American Bedroom there as well at this printer if I can. I love those guys. They're just spectacular. They're Excellent. Yeah, and the sound of that machine is it's just there's there's this rhythmic thing when you're when that the printer is just spitting out these sheets and you know it's just like it's just like a it's just a lovely sort of syncopation that I really really love. So yeah, I, I know completely great. what that experience must have been like for you seeing your own work coming out of there. Yeah, and then I had to sign each one, and that was a cool moment. And oh, yeah, nice. so yeah, it was. Um, yeah, and then you see your books, you know, when they're finally done, and so and they smell good. <laughs> oh yeah, it's a, a freshly <laughs> pressed page. There's nothing like that. Let's talk about American Bedroom, which sure. is a very amazing project. Not only visually, but just just the idea and how you. How do I want to say this? It's that 
you reveal how open people can be to complete strangers. Because it really is sort of jaw-dropping when you see these photographs and you realize what had it happened in order for you to gain entry and to, 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 make these, to make these images. It's just, I really love that. But tell us what American Bedroom is and how the idea popped in your head to photograph people in their bedrooms under the most intimate of circumstances. Okay, well, that's a that's a good question, um, and I have an answer. Uh, so, when the printing of Hometown was happening, you know, my mind was more freed up. You have space to think, you know, about maybe something else. So it's kind of gradual. Mm-hmm. But as as things are settling down with that project, you start to have this space in your head where you can be a little looser, a little freer. And so, anyway, one morning I got up in the spring. Uh, 2015, and I went to my window, which I like to see the morning. It was a beautiful sunrise, and I have a garden, and I'm looking out to see if anything's growing. And as I come back to bed, this beautiful golden light is going across my bed and across my husband, who's tangled up in the sheets with his little black socks that were left on from the night before we went out, and he never sleeps with his socks, and a snore mask on. Mm Mm-hmm. And bathed in light. And I just went, oh, my God. And I chuckled and I thought it was hilarious. And then I sat back into bed next to him and I'm like, but it's really telling. And then I said, but what about me? I mean, like, what would I look like next to him? And I just sort of imagined myself and I usually wear a T-shirt or a tank top and underwear. And I usually always wear colorful socks to bed and an eye mask. And then I started saying to myself, well, what's on the side table? What does that say about us? my stack of books, my sort of all my little sleep aids, Mm -hmm. coffee rings, if you will. So the coffee rings to me are symbolic of God being in the details because that's what I have on my side table. I'm not ashamed to admit it. I like to drink coffee in bed and he had all his things over there and what's on your floor and what are, what are your sheets or, you know, what are your comforter? What what kind of wall, what's art or, you know, do you have any art or what's your, is it a dirt floor? Is it a high rise? Everything in between. Mm -hmm. So I started thinking about it in this sort of anthropological study of human nature, if you will. And from there I started to mention it to people. So I'd, a couple of friends, I, I'd say, hey, what do you think of this? And I just started talking about it and asking people what they thought. And people were really interested in it. And then I would say, well, would you be willing to be in a picture like that? And a few people said yes, and more people than not would say no. I just kept thinking about it, ruminating. And then I met a couple at um, a yard sale a flea market actually. And she had these long, cool dreads and he was a cool dude. And I said, Hey, you guys, I'm doing this project. What do you think? And they're like, yeah, here, here's our number. Come on up. And that's Jessica. That's Jessica mm -hmm. sideways smoking the cigarette with her head tipped back. Mm -hmm. That's the first picture I took for American bedroom. I just knew exactly what I wanted. What I wanted in this project was not street photography, was not so much decisive moment. It was more about painting than anything. So I loved interior painting ever since I was a little kid. I used to watch my mom paint by window light and I just loved Vermeer and she had all her art books and, you know, I, I, I studied all those art books inside and out as a kid. And uh, she was really into Hopper and Wyeth and all those books are around and all her paintings are everywhere. So with this project, if I was going to do bedrooms, most of the time they'll be in an interior, not always, yeah. most of the time four walls, not always, and some sort of direction of light. So my idea was always a wide shot so we could show the details and the people within the frame. And I'm giving myself permission to move things. So in Jessica's photograph, for instance, Mm -hmm. and I'm saying this right up front, you know, I moved in the bong because the bong is part of the story and whatever her little note to herself. And we turned on the lights that were there, those little hot chili pepper lights, things like that. Yeah. The first at first she had a different outfit on. And then I said, do you have something else? And then she changed as she was changing. She had that little bra top on. I'm like, that's it. How about just that? And that's get her into a little less shape and her one last cigarette that she had one last (laughs) cigarette. And I told her, I said, you know, I owe you, I owe you a pack of cigarettes, you know, I'll buy you a pack of cigarettes, you know, next time I see you. And next time I saw her, uh, she had quit. (laughs) (laughs) 
This week, I conducted the first interview in our new studio. Though it's not 100% complete, I felt that it was ready enough. And I was really pleased with the result. You'll be hearing that episode next week, and I think you'll enjoy and hopefully appreciate the improved audio quality that it provides. From the beginning of the show, it's been my dream to have a dedicated space where I could conduct interviews and produce the show. Now, whether the photographer is local or visiting Los Angeles, I have a space where I can invite them and ensure that we can produce in-person interviews that sound great. Now, I'm always looking for ways to improve our remote interviews and make them sound better. So it's my hope that in the future, I'll be able to afford to direct guests to a sound studio near them where they can go for the interview and allow us to do what in public radio is called a, a tape sync. Even if they are across the country, it will sound like we were in the same room. But even without all that, we've come a long way from the days when I used nothing more than a handheld recorder. And a lot of that has been made possible because of your financial support. So if you love what we do here and you want to help us to make it even better, please become a Patreon supporter and commit to a reoccurring donation of $5 or more a month. Sign up today by visiting patreon.com forward slash The Candid Frame, or click on the link in the show notes or The Candid Frame website. Thanks. You're, you're speaking of um, a subtlety of seeing that uh, I think is really wonderful. And I think that being able to see in that way is one of the more wonderful challenges that one can have as a photographer because we're all often thinking about getting the moment you know that that the moment is king and the kinds of images that you're creating really demand that the viewer linger and take everything in and and do you think that the the qualities inherent to the images that command that the the viewer do more than just glance at it is it just what is it? Is it the light? Is it the subject? It, is it the composition? It's everything. It's all of those. I mean, yes, the composition is so important. That's where you start when you walk in a room. I never know what I'm going to find. Mm-hmm. I mean, some people I meet on the street, literally, and I'm going to their house. You know, I'm in Detroit. I'm going up into this abandoned house that all the windows are covered with black garbage bags. I, mean, I never know what I'm walking into. But... As a commercial photographer, I've been thrown everything and I can Mm -hmm. land on my feet. And so I know how to deal with these things, even though I'm not in the beginning. I didn't use any any light. I know a tripod from day one. The camera's on a tripod, 24 millimeter lens, 1.4. That's the lens Mm -hmm. it for the whole project. Keep it simple, stupid, you know, like just everything the same. And I'm just looking for that beautiful frame. And to be honest with you, I do change I'll start one place, and this is something I learned from Mary Ellen Mark, and I'll never forget it. And she's always in my head. She's always there. I'll go into a situation. I would walk in and would say, oh, there's the light. That's beautiful. Let me set up here. And you do, and you get a great shot. And then she comes into my head, and she says, move around the subject. Mm -hmm. And I do, and I go to the other side of the room somehow. Even if it's really difficult, I'll get to the other side. And sometimes that's the much better image that I didn't even think of approaching it that way. But yes, composition, there is a moment in there, but they are lingering moments. There's not a lot of movement in the imagery. There's a lot of um, what I call dreaming or or lingering moments, if you will, of people pontificating, if you will. They're telling me their story in between as I'm taking these pictures. So they're feeling like this is something special that's happening. Someone's paying attention to them And they'd like to tell me about their life and who they are. And what I find is in these moments, the big, the big things come up. Like every day you're talking to your family about the little things, who's going to clean out the dishwasher, you know, who's going to do the laundry, whatever. But now you've met a stranger and they want to tell you that they were in the war or they've had three failed marriages or they're alone and there's no one to talk to. One of the greatest, I think, statements that one of my subject made was this gentleman, Orville, and he's in Tennessee, and he's by a window, and it's very kind of uh, lit, uh, like Caravaggio. It's dark, and he's looking out, and he said to me, I'm tired of 
talking to myself. I'm, I'm tired of listening to myself. Hmm. And so <laughs> you have these uh, really intimate exchanges in period of time. And most of the time, it's all done within an hour. But it's really, for me, it's really about the humanity of these people and the collaboration. It's not me coming in and taking a picture of these people. That's not what's happening here. When I meet someone and I talk to someone about, would you like to be in my photograph, you know, in my, in my project, then it becomes our project, our photo, because I say, we're going to collaborate. And, you know, what would you, what would you like to, how do you see yourself in the bedroom? What would you like to be wearing or what do you normally wear? Um, a lot of people say they sleep in the nude and they just start stripping. I'm mm -hmm. not kidding. They're like, yeah, I sleep in the nude and this is how I want to be seen. You know, this is, this is me. So a lot of people are very interested in uh, being truthful and open and other people are, are quite shy and they don't, you know, they want to be in a bathrobe or something. But they're still saying yes. They are still saying your... yes. Which I think is really kind of fascinating because I, I know people will, will look at this project as, will ask the question, what kind of person opens them, themselves up, especially in the most intimate space in their home, to a perfect stranger? And yeah. I, I have an, uh, an idea, and you can tell me whether <laughs> I'm off or not, but, the, but you've already sort of said it. I kind of feel that the people who say yes to not just your work, but to any, any photographer is that they just want to be seen. They just want mm -hmm. to be acknowledged and in, in some in many cases listened to. And do you think that that is a, a big part of why people say yes to you? I, I do. I think there's a lot of very lonely people in the world. And that's something that I've been discovering as I travel. There's a lot of lonely people in the world. And just to talk to a new person, to tell your story to a new person, even if it means bringing them into the bedroom, they agree to it. I, I, I'm... I'm shocked at how open people are. Mm -hmm. I'm shocked some, when people say yes. I mean, <laughs> but then once they say yes, then it's the two of us. And for some reason, people open up to me. I'm fairly friendly, so I don't think they're put off or, or nervous around me. So there's, I think that's helpful. And uh, we, I just talk with them. Maybe we have a little coffee, uh, chit-chat. Or we go right into it, and then we have coffee after, mm -hmm. which I want to do with the people if I can, and then I'll listen to their full story. And then sometimes I get their statement right there and then by listening. Yeah. The idea of approaching a stranger to make their photograph is something that a lot of photographers would love to do, but they're terrified of the idea of just approaching someone. Uh, you're taking it a whole lot further. <laughs> <laughs> because you're going up to a complete stranger and going, hey, can I come up to your bedroom and make photographs of you? And uh, the results are uh, amazing. Just to be honest with you, I, it's not always like that. I do a lot of things, a myriad of ways to get my subjects. So it could be a friend of a friend. It mm -hmm. could be someone that reaches out to me and says, hey, I live you know, in uh, Arizona. Are you coming there? And I'd love to do it with you. But what I do is I put um, something on Instagram and I put something on Facebook to say, hey, I'm traveling to Florida. Does anybody know anybody that lives, you know, in, in you know, Miami or in Tampa? Uh, I'm looking for couples, older couples, mm -hmm. which was the case when I went to Florida. And, and then people write to me and, and then I start on contacting people. And a lot of them don't pan out and some do pan out. Yeah. And I think I just look at it as whatever is going to work out is exactly what was supposed to happen for the, for the image. And for me to connect with somebody and this to happen for this person. But I'm sure That's some, I, some family and friends look at you and go, Barbara, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> I guess I'm kind of used to that a little bit. <laughs> so as you've, you know, you've traveled uh, across the, the country, you know, photographing these people, tell us about the sort of the logistics because you're still, mm -hmm. you know, you're still a commercial photographer. You know, your kids are older, but, you know, they're still around. So... How does that sort of work with all the stuff that you, you're doing? Yeah, it does work better now that the kids, you know, the kids are grown and they're out. Although we, my husband and I moved to Portland, Maine, two years ago, and now they came too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so my, my two youngest, my two youngest came actually to work in the family business, to work in the restaurant. Uh, okay. So, but they love Portland. It's a very hip, cool city. I don't know if you've been, but you really have to come. And it's the number one foodie town. 
or foodie city in the country as um, as of last year by Bon Appetit. So you can imagine. Yeah. It's a crazy place. So they, they're up here now. And then my other son, my eldest son lives in Cambridge still, but he come, it's only an hour and a half. So they're all around. But day to day, I don't have anyone that I have to take care of really necessarily husband a little bit, but you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, so everyone's uh, busy doing their own thing and I, I, I can, I can go off for two weeks at a time and do my thing. So that works out pretty well. Logistics of traveling. It is, it is not as easy as it looks. Mm-hmm. The end result looks amazing. Like, Oh my gosh, you know, she got to go here and she got to go there and she met these people and, and I did meet all those people and it was amazing. But the actual traveling of it, um, you know, I, I have some grant money that uh, I have to travel as frugally as possible. So I get the, you know, the cheapest plane flight and the cheapest little economic car and cheap hotels, which if you knew me, you'd be like, wow, she stayed in there. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> but yeah, and that's what you do. And, and, and you don't eat out, you know, you just get a, you know, food that you put in a, um, you know, in the back seat, uh, in a cooler and, uh, you try to keep your, so there's that and it's long days. So if you're going to photograph something, someone super early in the morning, which you do, and then you're out trying to meet people and then you're trying to go to diners where, you know, diners are a great place to meet the locals and, and ask someone if they know anyone. And I have little cards that I print up. And on the back, it says how long I'll be in an area. So yeah. if I'm somewhere for two days, I'll leave that card around and I'll pass them out. And I've gotten people that way. I've gotten uh, the, the couple, the nude couple with the woman who has the tattoo on her back and mm-hmm. they're on a red, yeah. um, red, red sheet. I was told by someone, I actually don't remember who, but I was told by someone that that image basically won me the Getty. Wow. And they said that they just kept coming back and kept coming back to that image. And I only had about, I only entered 15 images for the, I think I didn't have a lot of images at that time. And uh, someone told me that. And uh, so there you go. You have to be clever how you're meeting people and uh, you just get out there and, but it's a long day and then you're meeting people and then you're going to do another shoot in the afternoon. And then maybe you meet someone and you're going to go to their house at seven. And so I'll go back and process images so I have them in the bag and they go up to the cloud. So if I get robbed or something or I lose, yeah, I don't want to lose anything. So now you're up till one o'clock in the morning and then you're going to get up at 530. So it's not a complaint. It's just, you know, yeah. it's a grind. But you got to get you got to get the you got to make it the most of it. There you are in that place and you want you got to make the most of it. How long had you been working on the project when you applied for the grant? I had been working spring about a year okay so tell me about the process of working for the grant because sometimes the, the, the applying for a grant can be as torturous as trying to get a home loan <laughs> oh my god yeah so here's the story on that and i i hope uh I hope people will be encouraged by this. So I had the idea, as I told you, and I started shooting. And then um, I had another, uh, my son's roommate is a furry. So that shot with a guy with the... um, Explain what a furry is, because some people may not know. Okay, so you wear uh, animal costumes uh, for your intimate moments. Let me put it that way. Okay. (laughs) So the guy, he's got um, a room that's just chock full of all this stuff. And then he's got the, the fox head on in a jock strap. Have you seen this image? It's just, uh, the room is just covered with stuff that, that he lives around. He's got yeah. three computer screens he's playing on. Anyway, yeah. mm-hmm. so I did his photo because he said, yeah, I'll do it. So I did his photo. So his photo was, it was in the mix and just some other people that I talked to and had met. Um, so there, there, there weren't a lot of shoots that I had done, but for about a year. And then when I moved to Portland, I did a few up here. So I had a little bit of city and I, I started writing grants, uh, answering grant applications in the fall of 2016. And I think I did about seven and I started getting the rejections. Mm-hmm. One after the other, just one after the other. And then one day I got like two in a row and I just sat down. Okay. And this is the truth. And I'm not even, I'm not even elaborating this. I sat down and I said to myself, okay, I guess I could be totally wrong about this. This just might not be a very good project. Obviously, you know, it's, it's not winning anything. And I could be wrong. And then I went one step further and I was like, 
maybe I'm just not a, an artist. Maybe what I should do is forget about being an artist and go get a job at Trader Joe's and just like free my mind of all this because this is just too much. This is like, I, I this is crazy. I literally, I had that thought and I thought about that for about a day. And the next morning I got up and I went, what the, what the <laughs> hell am I thinking? Are you kidding me? You know what I have to do? I just have to take better pictures. That's the answer. That's it. Mm. Just stay focused, put boots on the ground. And if my pictures aren't good enough, we'll take better pictures. And that was my talk. And then about two weeks later, I won the Getty. Wow. <laughs> so you great. can't give up. <laughs> you just have to. I mean, the thing is, it's really hard sometimes to believe in yourself. Mm-hmm. If you're not getting any feedback, but I was getting great feedback on American Bedroom because I was starting to post on Facebook and Instagram and I was, people were loving it. And so I, I, I was a little confused, like, could I be that wrong? But I think that it it is hard to believe in yourself sometimes, but you just have to persevere. That's it. Just keep going. (laughs) Yeah. Talk about the choice to put it on, on, on social media. Cause some people are, want to be very guarded about their projects and they don't want to share it for any variety of different reasons. Why did you choose to put it out there? You know, at first I was not going to at first. And I even had this conversation with my son and I was just like, you know what? I'm not, I'm not going to, but you know what? I would, I wouldn't be where I am with this project now if I hadn't done that. I mean, people say, aren't you afraid of, you know, copycats or giving up too much of it so no one will buy your book? Mm-hmm. And I, I think that the benefits from showing the work, I mean, interviews, you know, people that have featured the work, it's now been in about 35 articles all over the world. Mm-hmm. And I actually have made, um, sometimes I get paid for that. And I'm sell- I sold some prints, actually through a show too, I sold some prints. But I think it's okay, you know, for me, it's working. I know that I won't put everything up and I can't put everything up. There's a lot of, you know, n- nudes that I can't put up. Mm-hmm. So not everything is up. And as I get closer to the end of the project, I'll probably hold back quite a bit and not show the newer work. But I do think it's a decision that, that each individual has to make. But I do think that it's, it, it, it works a lot in favor for people who are trying to, to uh, get their work out there. Yeah. I think that as far as I'm concerned, I think that it's, you have much more to gain than to lose. Because a, uh, yeah, a lot of people who, who worry about copycatting don't realize that most people out there are incredibly lazy. And so even though they might like to, they're never going to do it. And even those who do attempt it uh, are not going to do it in the same way that you're doing it and no. and create as distinctive a body of work because the reason why they're doing it is not as true as the reasons you're doing it and the images reflect that. That's why it I would always it. yeah. I mean, it's like any anybody who's who's an artist. Uh, if you're a painter, you're going to paint a different painting of the same subject. It's going to be completely different. And so yeah, I think everyone has their own vision and hopefully people wouldn't, you know, would want to do their own thing. I have had one copycat already and they called it American Bedroom and I asked them very nicely if they would change their title mm-hmm. and which they did and they've only shot in one state. So I said, "Hmm, why don't you do something with the state, you know, change your title." And they and they did. But what uh, are you going to do? Yeah. <laughs> so, where are you now and how much longer do you expect to uh to be working on the project and what's your end goal with it? So um, I um, am hoping for about another year and a half. I have all of the Midwest to do, like all of it. Mm. The Pacific Northwest as well and Texas. (laughs) So I have all those places to go. I am going to Portland, however, because I'm going to be having a show there at the Blue Sky Gallery in Portland, Oregon in July. So since I'll be going there for this show, I'll probably spend, I'll probably spend like three weeks out there since it's kind of far. Mm-hmm. And so I'll, 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 I'll do that. And uh, so that'll be that, that area. And then I think, I think I'm going to head to Texas potentially in April. I have a friend that's going there. And so I'm just going to kind of see her and, uh, and then uh, do some work in Texas. Probably the first. It'll t- take me a few trips because <laughs> yeah. it's pretty big. And then in the summer, I'm hoping to uh, start in some of the Midwest areas. 
So as you can see, there's there's a lot of ground to cover. I think um, I, I have written some more grant proposals and I'm hoping with fingers crossed uh, for a little bit more money. And if I do uh, get some more money, I'll be able to maybe go for a little bit longer and, and expedite some things, get, you know, some trips faster. (laughs) With a project like this, um, the question always arises for people is releases, whether you get signed releases for all the people that you photograph, even though this is an an art project for, for a large part, do you get them and why? I don't. I stay in contact with almost all of the people that I photographed, especially, you know, the, the, the photos that are clearly going, going to be uh, contenders. Mm-hmm. Not all of them. Some people I've met and I've lost contact on. I'll probably never be able to get contact with them again because they had a burner or, you know, I don't know. I just, they're not going to be reachable. But um, I don't. I used to always, as a commercial photographer and as a stock photographer, and I always hated that moment when you put a model release in front of someone and they sign it. You know, I could be smarter about it and perhaps I should be doing it. But I think most of the people that I've photographed that are contenders, I've been in communication with, I've sent them pictures. Mm -hmm. Um, So uh, sometimes hard copy. Um, So uh, I'm hoping it works out that it's not an issue. (laughs) Yeah, for, for my understanding of it. But it's a question that uh, a lot of people ask. So I thought I'd throw that out there. Yeah, sure. So now that you've moved to Portland, how has that changed your commercial work? I was always outside of a city, and I had a rep that was in New York, and then I had a rep in Chicago. So, And I was in workbook every year, you know, the workbook. Mm-hmm, yeah. So that's more uh, if you want to be seen. Workbook is basically where you're seen, so it doesn't really matter where you live. Um, but I have slowed down a bit. I don't have a rep anymore, so I have a little bit looser schedule. And if some things come my way, I'm up for two jobs right now. If I get either of them, great. Um, if I don't, that's okay. I do uh, some little small jobs up here. Now that I've moved here, I met someone whose uh, daughter is a model, and I've been doing some fashion, some small fashion sh- little shoots and uh, with kids. And I like that because they're small shoots. You know, they're like 5000 or less, and uh, that's everything. <laughs> and I'll hire a stylist, and they'll they'll send me the clothes I've been doing uh, from Australia. The clothing is coming from these companies or England or whatever. And they send me the clothes. I hire the kids. I come up with a concept. I'll go out to this beautiful, you know, city, Portland, which is near the water and the ocean and this, you know, brick everywhere and cobblestones and it's beautiful. So I'll come up with a a concept and I'll do the shoot and done deal. So I've done a bunch of those uh, little shoots for people. So that's been, that's been fine. So I think everything is sort of, sort of settling uh, in a little different way for me. Um, I'm pretty focused on American bedroom and that's taken up a lot of time. There's a lot of post work when you come back, like I say, you know, communicating with the people and, you know, making sure uh, the images are stored properly and processed and, you know, getting the statements and all this. So, uh, and writing the grants, those are time consuming. And then I had a show here in Portland and that was great. I sold three, uh, no, five prints to the Lauder Foundation. So that was awesome because that put me back on the road. Oh, nice. Yeah. So that was good. So, you know, I've never been a greedy person. In other words, uh, a little bit is fine for me. Just, you know, just to keep going. Uh, it's all good. Yeah. Just keep the wheels greased. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, just want to, you know, what are we going to do in this life? You know, we're going to have, uh, you know, love and family, you know, having for me being a mom is, is, is the greatest thing I'll ever do. Yeah. That nothing, nothing, nothing could su- supersede that. Nothing. All this is, is kind of like icing on the cake. I, I, I think that I'm an artist ever since I've been a kid, you know, running around with a camera since I've been like four years old. And, you know, there was art everywhere in our house and music and That's always the way it was going to be for me. So uh, nothing's really changed. Uh, I just like, you know, being in awe of the world and and, uh, appreciating it for everything that it has to offer. And being able to do a project like this is a privilege. Yeah. It's a huge privilege. Uh, And getting to know these people, you know, and and some of them, you know, break my heart a little. Uh, For sure, after I photographed the woman, uh, China, 
in Manhattan who is living on the streets of Manhattan reading her book. Mm, yeah. For a week, I felt like someone sucker punched me. I didn't let her out of my mind. I, I, and I tried to write to her. She said she gets her email at the library every once in a while. But someone saw her and they wrote to me on uh, Instagram and they said, Barb, I saw your girl. What can I bring her? I said, bring her some fruit, bring her some food, bring her some books. But I've never heard back from her. So it does break my heart a little. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> well, my last question, which I ask each guest, is I ask them to recommend one photographer for our listeners to discover and explore on their own. And it can be anyone, someone you've long admired or someone you've recently discovered. So who would that one photographer be and why? All right. Well, let's see. There is a photographer that I just discovered recently. And also, um, I'd like to mention Anne-Marie Weber because she's been traveling with me um, for half of this project. So we kind of travel together and share the costs. And she's doing a project called Locked and Loaded USA. So she's photographing people across the country with their uh, firearms. Mm -hmm in all kinds of situations. So she could use a boost. That would be great. Everybody go check her out. And then the other um, artist that I just discovered is Stephanie Gengotti. Are you familiar with her? No. How do you spell her last name? It's G-E-N-G-O-T-T-I. Okay. And I just discovered her. She's French and Italian, and she's done all this fabulous work, but one of them, one of her projects is called Circus Love. Mm. Wow. Like, I'm obsessed. <laughs> <laughs> Just the title alone. <laughs> yeah. So she's great. Well, thank you for that. And thank you for your time. I really enjoyed meeting you in Miami and having the chance to talk with you again. It was really a joy. Absolutely. Thank you so much. It's been an honor. Thanks to Barbara for sharing her time and story with us. You can find out more about her and her work by visiting her website at barbarapeacock.com. And I'll be in Washington, D.C. in May for the Focus on the Story Photographic Conference. The International Photo Festival will feature some of the world's best photojournalists and documentary photographers, as well as talks, photo walks, and workshops, of which I am teaching one. If you want to sign up for my workshop or just want to find out more about the event, visit FocusOnTheStory.org. And remember to check out my YouTube channel where I discuss different aspects of photography by pulling images from listeners like you who contribute to the Candid Frame Flickr Pool. You can check out the TCF Flickr Pool and our YouTube channel by clicking on the link in the show notes or the website. My new book, Making Photographs, Developing a Personal Visual Workflow, is now available. In it, I translate how to see and use light and shadow, line and shape, color and gesture to make great photographs. It's more than just how to make a good picture, but how you can develop a personal and intimate way of seeing and documenting the world around you. You can order the book today. And when you place your order from the Rocky Nook website, use the promo code Pirello40 to receive 40% off the list price. Check out the website and the show notes for the link. And if you want to keep up with all things Candid Frame, sign up for our mailing list and you'll receive three free copies of my previously published ebooks. And if you like what you're hearing on the show, please take the time today to write a review in the iTunes store as it helps our ranking and creates greater awareness. You can also support the show by making a monthly contribution through Patreon, or you can make a one-time contribution via PayPal. You'll find the links for both in the show notes and the website. Thanks to Lars Hegard for his recent contribution. I so appreciate it. And if you want to easily access every episode of The Candid Frame, download The Candid Frame app. It's available for both Apple iOS and Android, and it's free. Download it today. You'll find it where everything else is in the show notes or the website at thecandidframe.com. And we also have an Alexa app. So if you have one of those smart devices, download the skill and listen to the show that way. We are everywhere. The Candid Frame's audio engineer is Martin Taylor, who you can find at the other martintaylor.com. The show's senior producer is Cynthia Parker, and our music is from Kevin McLeod, whose royalty free music can be found at incompetech.com. And you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at simply at ebodyandx. And this is ebodyandx, and this is The Candid Frame.